Hi, my name's Chris Jarvis, and I'm one of the people lucky enough to work here in Oxford University's Museum of Natural History. Now, when most people think about natural history museums, they think about dinosaurs. <laughs> now that's fine because, well, we do have dinosaurs and we are quite famous for them. In fact, in this museum, you can see this, which is the first ever bit of any dinosaur ever discovered and described anywhere in the world, the Megalosaurus. But actually, we have seven million things within these walls, and most of them are not dinosaurs. In fact, five million of them are insects. And if you knew our collections and could walk around behind the scenes, you'd probably be thinking about this Natural History Museum more as a museum of bugs. Of those five million insects in our collections, and we have insects from all around the world, one million of them are British insects. And the British insect collection here at the museum is kept in cabinets like this, in drawers. Just like this one, full of these amazing ground beetles. Now with the help of the National Heritage Lottery Fund, we're recurating these insects at the moment so that we can store them and scientists can look at them for many, many years to come. So what is an insect and why do we collect them? Now insects belong to the largest group of animals on our planet, a group of animals we call the arthropods. And within the arthropods, we have several groups. There are the crustaceans, crabs, prawns, lobsters, those sorts of things. The arachnids, the spiders and scorpions with eight legs. Then we have the many-legged animals, the centipedes and the millipedes, what we call the myriapods. And the largest group of arthropods are the insects. Now, they all look very different, but they do share several things in common. All of our arthropods have jointed legs and they all have a hard skeleton on the outside of their body, like a suit of armour. It's called an exoskeleton. So what makes insects different from other arthropods? Well, here at the museum, we don't just have dead insects. We also have some live little friends that might help us find out. So, to be an insect, although you have an exoskeleton and jointed legs like the other arthropods, you do have to have a certain type of body. You have to have three bits of your body. So all insects have a head, a thorax, which is where all the big muscles are on the insects, and an abdomen, which is basically where its tummy is. And the other thing all insects have is six legs. So who collected all these insects and why? Well, these insects in our collection were collected by a very famous scientist you might have heard of called Charles Darwin on a voyage he made around the world on the ship called the Beagle, where he visited a place called Australia. And why did he collect them and why do we keep them? Well, actually, the insects themselves are important, but not as important as the information that goes with them. If I hold this dung beetle that Charles Darwin collected up, you'll notice something very interesting, not just the insect on its pin, also, on his pin, you'll be able to make out some little labels with some writing. You might even be able to see Charles Darwin's own little signature there. This is our data. The reason we collect this is so that we know who caught it, when they caught it, and where they caught it. With this data, we know this beetle was found in Sydney at this point in time. You could go back to Sydney today and you could search for this insect. And if you didn't find it, it would tell you something in that environment has changed. So our collection is as much about data and looking at changes in the world as it is about the physical insects. 
a good example of how scientists have used British insects to find out about environmental changes are these moths in here. These moths were studied by a scientist called Mr Kettlewell, particularly these moths here, peppered moths. He started to look at them and look at old specimens that had been collected and noticed that there was enormous variation amongst them. In fact, I've got a little drawer here that shows you how varied this one species can be. You'll see, some of them are much lighter and some of them are much darker. Now, Kettlewell noticed that there had been a change over time. And actually, as Britain had got dirtier during the Industrial Revolution, and factories had been spewing out more and more smog, there were more darker ones around than there were lighter ones. He reasoned that the lighter ones stood out more in amongst all the soot and smog, and so were getting gobbled up, giving rise to a larger race of darker varieties. This showed evolution in action, but it also showed how appalling and smoggy and sooty and polluted our cities were becoming. And that helped people to think about what they had to do to clear up their environment. So you might be asking by now, how do you catch insects? I mean, they're tiny and they move really, really quickly. Well, there are several easy ways to catch insects. And the way the scientists normally use them is, well, there are lots of methods, lots of equipment, things like butterfly nets for catching flying insects, always very good. If you're going for things living in long grass or uh, stiff bushes, you need something a bit more robust like this beating net, which is a butterfly net, but with a much stiffer edge and a big strong rod down the middle so you can really whack it through those grasses and actually catch everything in there. What about things living in trees and bushes? Well, we have these in the museum which are fantastic little beating traps, but all it really is, is a white sheet on a frame. You can get a white sheet, you stick it underneath a tree, and then you spend a good couple of minutes having some fun bashing the tree like mad until all the insects fall out onto your sheet. And then you can see what you've got. Obviously, they're gonna run away quickly. So what you need to do to study them nice and closely is get yourself a jam jar or even a nice clear plastic freezer bag like this. Scoop them into there, close it up, your insects will be alive and you can have a really good look at them. See what you've got, look at the variety, look at the numbers, look at where they live, which insects you catch and which bits in your garden, and then obviously you can let them go. The museum though, if we're doing a proper scientific study, we might not let them go. We might have to keep them and a lot of people say, well, that's a bit cruel. I mean, here are some insects that I've caught myself. And I've already explained that actually the data is really important for our collections and it helps us ask lots of questions and discover a lot about the world that we live on. But people say, why do you put them on pins? Well, insects are very delicate things. And if I wanted to pick up this bee here, I'd probably break it with my big clumsy fingers. If we have it on a pin though, I can simply take the pin, pull it off, and I can look all the way around it without actually ever having to touch it or damage it in any way. And because our curators here at the museum look after all of these millions of insects on their pins so well, we have the oldest pinned insect in the world in this museum. It's a bath white butterfly that was caught in Cambridgeshire about 320 years ago. They're looking after it so well, we hope your descendants will be able to come and look at it in another 320 years from now. And their descendants, 320 years after that, and they'll be able to ask questions about the environment that butterfly was caught in and the changes around us that we see in the planet. So why are insects so important? Why do we collect so many of them? And why do we have more insects and tiny bugs than dinosaurs? Well, I think really one of the reasons is insects are much more important to us today. Without the insects, we'd all die. Insects keep our world alive in several ways. First of all, they make our food. Insects, like the bees in the museum's hive here, fly from flower to flower to feed and drink. And as they move from flower to flower, they move pollen from one flower to another, 
And it's that pollen that helps turn a flower into a seed or a fruit that we eat or something else eats before we eat that. There are 253 different kinds of bee just in Britain, over 30,000 worldwide. And it's not just the bees, it's the wasps, the beetles, the flies. They're all important pollinators and they all keep us alive by making food for us. Here are just a few foods that are pollinated by insects. I wonder if you can remember them all, or if you can find any in your kitchen, or if you can find any that aren't mentioned on my list. Mm. Apples, pears, potatoes, carrots, cucumbers, oranges, mangoes, pumpkins, peppers, cherries, tomatoes, beans, peas, coconuts, peanuts, blueberries, blackberries, blackcurrants, redcurrants, grapes, aubergines, courgettes, brussels sprouts, chili peppers, melons, peaches, avocados, figs, lemons, limes, lychees, and most importantly, chocolate. But it's not just by making our food that insects keep our world alive. They also perform another really important job. They clear away all of the dead stuff and recycle it. If you think about it, there's an awful lot of dead plant and animal material appearing on this planet every day. So where does it go? Well, things like this burying beetle, chew it up, swallow it, digest it, and poo out the waste. And they recycle all that nutrient by helping turn it back into soils for new life to grow in. And it's not just the dead stuff. Have you ever wondered where all the poo in the world goes. I mean, there's a lot of animals out there, so there must be a lot of poo somewhere. Well, again, it's the insects that recycle that for us too. This is a picture of one elephant poo. It's pretty big, isn't it? But elephants don't just do one poo a day. No, on average, elephants do seven, eight or nine poos a day. And that's a lot of poo just from elephants. This is a cow pat that one of our scientists here at the museum filmed and you can immediately see how it instantly attracts insect life. Things like these flies and the dung beetles immediately arrive to start chewing it up and breaking it down and recycling all that nutrient and getting rid of all that poo for us. Oh, there's one. In fact, when you look inside the cow pat, as he did, you can see just how alive it is with dung beetles doing that crucial work of breaking down all that poo and clearing it up for us. This is a big tropical dung beetle. It's beautiful. But this one comes from a nice warm bit of the tropics where the beetles can get quite big. We have more than 50 species of dung beetle in this country and they do an amazing job clearing up all that poo. In fact, here's a nice ball of poo that's been rolled up by a dung beetle. They'd roll it up, bury it deep underground, and lay their little egg in it. In that egg would hatch a little larvae, which would chew out a nice little hollow inside that ball of poo as a home. Mm. Lovely. So the reason it's important to study insects and the reason we have collections like this, it's because they are such an integral part of our life on the planet. Without the insects, we'd have nothing to eat, no chocolate, and we'd be drowning in dead stuff and poo. So pretty important to find out about them. And not just that, they're fascinating, and you can find them anywhere. In fact, have a look around your garden and see what you can find.